Welcome to After Deadline, the media podcast. We're your host, Kathy Fowler. And I'm Mark Silverstein. We are veteran TV news reporters who turned to the dark side, and now we work as PR and marketing gurus and podcast hosts. You're going to love our guest this week. He's a three-time Emmy Award-winning political journalist who was honored for his coverage of the 2016 election and so much more. He hails from North Carolina. He's an anchor at Spectrum News One in Charlotte. Plus, he's no stranger to the podcast scene because he hosts his own. It's called Tying It Together. We are excited to welcome Tim Boyum. So, Kathy, let me tell you about this guy. Uh, he, here, here's the short and sweet of it. He is the Steve Hartman of politics. I, I, I really like his stuff, his, his, his work, his, his writing, his storytelling. It, it, you know, it is not typical look at politics. It is, you know, thoughtful, in-depth, and, and he tells such great stories. Is he on? Is he here with us? Because I didn't, I didn't want him to hear any yeah. of that. I don't, I don't even know what to say, man. I'm honored. Thank you so much. I mean, that's exactly what we're going for. So I couldn't ask for anything better than that. <laughs> no, it is. It, it, you really tell, you know, it, it isn't left versus right. I mean, I guess it is, but it, it isn't just, you know, telling people what they want to hear. It's, I mean, you really look into things thoughtfully and, and you give it time and it breathes and it, and it, you know, it, it's interesting to listen to what, no matter what team you're playing for. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is there's so much on TV news right now, just back and forth of politicians and people can't relate to that. And we just had this sort of idea of how is this playing out in our communities? You know, those are the people that watch our news or listen to our podcasts. And so th that, that was our goal was to go out and do this. And I'm, I'm 45, I'm 20, almost 25 years into my profession, and I've never been so excited about what I do for a living. And uh, that's pretty exciting in this day and age in, in, with any media company. <laughs> He's so good. He's not afraid to say his age. <laughs> no journalist i'm supposed to be honest right <laughs> transparent and honest <laughs> yeah but it's still the tv biz you know the... <laughs> i can't hide the gray hair anymore so <laughs> you can just do you know, like zoom filter that's you know that's what right. you're gonna do, which, which i am doing <laughs> full transparency it's up as high as it can go <laughs> so let's go back to the beginning what, what got you started what made you want to pursue political journalism what was your first job how did this all become yes yeah, so i'm from minnesota i went to a school called st cloud state and i wanted to sort of see the country to be a better journalist so i i took a job over the phone in a little tiny place called Eureka, California, which is four hours north of San Francisco. Yes, there's still that much north of San Francisco. I've known people who worked in Eureka, California, yeah. There's actually some, some good people that come out of there. You, you really can cut your teeth, you can screw up, you can learn things, learn from your mistakes and move on. And then I really wanted to go to a different place. And again, so I found this you know, new operation wasn't even launched yet, 24 Hour News, which back in, you know, 2001, which when I was kind of interviewing it, nobody knew what these re were really, you know, the cable networks were still rising and there was New York One in New York City, which if anybody knows that, that we're a sister station of theirs. So I, I took a risk again. I sold everything I owned, packed what I could into my little Ford ZX2 and drove across the country and took another job over the phone. And I came here and was sort of a general assignment reporter but I started covering more statewide stuff as we grew and they asked me to cover politics. And I, to be honest, I was a little apprehensive at first um, because of the view of politics from the outside world, but I started covering it and I'm a huge sports fan and I really got attracted to sort of the competition of it early on, which now actually kind of bothers me in some ways that that's the focus of politics, ironically. But then I got married, I had kids, and they're natives in North Carolina. And so we sort of decided to make this home and I'm here. And so now I care about taxes, house prices, the educational system, the roads out there. And so it's become part of my life and I understand it better now than ever, which I think makes me a better political journalist. So it started as like, you know, almost like sports, like the competition, the thrill of the elections. And now it's really under understanding about why it's more important for our viewers the issues, which is what led us to front porch politics, which is the, the storytelling. So Tim, you note that one of the highlights in your career was covering the 2016 election cycle, that you spent countless hours reporting live from the, you know, the floors of both the Democratic and Republican national conventions. And 
ultimately you were recognized as one of the top capital reporters in the in the country, top capital reporters in the country. What was it like to cover such a pivotal election and then ultimately receive that honor? Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, all, all the credit goes to my employers. You know, I work for Charter and Spectrum News is our company. I mean, they, they, they're they willing to fund, these trips are not cheap to, to do this. You got to travel with a whole bunch of people. You got to pay to get passes and all that kind of stuff. And they were willing to do that because they place value on politics where a lot of local TV doesn't. And, you know, I do nightly show too. And so we did our show nightly there most of the time because we were trying to do all kinds of things. I actually did, at one time, I think I did three hours of live television from the floor of the convention without any, you know, playback or seeing what was airing. And, and we just went with it. It was wild. But that obviously was a crazy election. And these conventions are just amazing. I mean, from from the aspect of just getting to be there, you know, watching the Ted Cruz speech where he was, you know, they were booing him and then Donald Trump comes down. I was right there and saw that. I mean, to see that history is just wild. And, and to watch the party, the Republican Party, you know, coalesce around this, you know, celebrity essentially was wild. And I got to interview him that year. So during the campaign. So that was, you know, fascinating. And, and in the meantime, just behind the scenes, you know, we're up on the row where all the cable networks are doing stuff too. And I'm walking down the hall during the Democratic convention, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, MC Hammer, uh, Ashley Judd, they're just walking by. And so that's the, that is a cool part. I covered a convention. I'm going to tell you, you want to talk about age. Okay. This was the 1980 Democratic Convention in New York. And, and I was more thrilled about, I remember like coming out from under the stands into the, into the convention center. And, and I, right in front of me, like it just got quiet. And I just saw these wingtips. I was looking down and I just saw these wingtips walking. And then I looked up and it was Dan Rather. And like the, the C part, and this is 1980. So, I mean, he was at the height and he goes down onto the floor and he starts talking and he's saying, Walter. And I'm like, oh my God, he's talking to Walter. This is, <laughs> I was more excited about that stuff. Well, the best part, the, one of the best parts is in the middle of the afternoon, when there's like nothing going on, that's when the musicians practice for that evening. And I'll never forget, I was like three feet from the stage and Paul Simon was rehearsing and Jesse Jackson was literally standing next to me. And I'm just sitting there thinking like, I'm just this schmuck for grew up in Minnesota. That's a local <laughs> journalist in North Carolina. I'm like what in the world? <laughs> like, But it's just neat to witness history like that. It's such an honor um, to do it, but it's a commitment. You know, we interviewed back to a more real world you know, we interviewed all of our members of Congress, our senators, you know, the, the gubernatorial, gubernatorial candidates were there. And so we're bringing that back home again and putting it in a context for our viewers. And we're one of the few local stations that does that. And so, yeah, it's just an honor. I've been to everyone, I think, since starting in 04. So it's, it, it they're, they're highlights. There's no question about it. Yeah, but then yeah. you got, you got recognition for your 2016 coverage. I mean, was that a big deal? Was, I mean, do you like, you know, I mean, is that outside validation or you're like, I don't necessarily care about the awards, the events and being there, all that kind of, I mean, what does that feel like? Well, I'll tell you a funny story. So I, I did a lot of straightforward journalism for my first 15, 18 years. And I used to, and it was very straightforward. I mean, if you've been in the business, you know, it's track sound by track sound by back to the anchor, you know, and it wasn't great. I mean, it was good, but it was, you know, important journalism, but it wasn't. So I never won awards and I never really put in front. I was like, I don't care about awards, you know, but then I got that Washington Post recognition and it's like, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and now we're doing the storytelling stuff. And in the last three years, I've been nominated for, I think, 11 Emmys and won three. So it's like, yeah. Not that you're counting. Not, not that, that you're counting at all. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I don't care about awards. I yeah. don't care, but I'm but just the, building a whole shelf but, on the back of yeah. my- but, Well, that's what everybody got busted for when during COVID, when all the reporters were doing yes. reports from their homes and they, you know, FTV Live would be pointing out that how many Emmys they would have behind them in their in their Maybe shot. I made sure mine weren't in the background. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in all honesty, I mean, it is nice, but it is out. I, to your point, it, it is important for outside validation, particularly when we're doing something about, you know, we're going to do seven minute stories on, on a politician. P, you know, most news executives would say, no way. No. The 
you know, this this week, Monday through Friday. That, yeah, that's I mean, a ratings total... <laughs> killer for most news organizations. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to uh, make all our viewers go away? Do seven minutes on any exactly. politician. And those shows, those shows, they've shown spikes in ratings, and we've won Emmys for them. So it's it's super it's super important for that validating to show that audiences do want to see that kind of in depth coverage, do want to see things that are different than you know. I have a hard time watching local news now done in the traditional way because it is so surface you know driven and not engaging. And so it, it's it's been life changing to be honest with you. So everybody you know everybody has their strong views about politics. I'm guessing maybe even you do. I mean, you say you now live in North Carolina, your kids are there, your family's there. I mean, this impacts you. So what is the best way to cover politics, you know, when, when even when, and, and stay objective? I mean, I still think it's, it's, it, it's just vital. I mean, we've seen some news organizations veer one or the other because they know they'll get at least half the audience and that's better than less than half, right? But we're journalists and we need to remain that way. I actually tell people like people say, what's your opinion on this? It's weird. I've, I've been so focused on hearing the various opinions. I don't know if I have opinions on anything anymore. It's kind of weird. And be, but it's it's validating. The biggest compliment I ever get is when people tell me they have no idea where I lean on something. And so I view my job. I think I heard Anderson Cooper to say this once. I view my job as being a bit skeptical of everyone and questioning everyone. And so when I'm preparing to interview Donald Trump, I actually reach out to Democrats to th get their view on what they would want to ask him or what they're critical of him. And so I'm prepared for that. You know, some people get mad when we interview people like Donald Trump or there's some Republicans here in North Carolina that are put in the same basket as him. And they say, well, you know, they're radical, they're extremists, 100 percent wrong, they're lying, you can't cover them. But the truth is, is they may be the next leaders of our state and our country. And so we need to understand them, even if we disagree with them. Doesn't mean we don't call out, so to speak, or, you know, use the facts to point things out. But tone is super important for me. Even when I'm, I know someone's lying and I confront them, I don't do it in a way that is, is in their face, confrontational. My bottom line is I want our, our viewers to understand the truth, different viewpoints, and be able to make up their own minds at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? How do you not lose your collective stuff? <laughs> when the beautiful thing of it is when you stay objective and don't allow your personal opinions to get into it, it's super easy I, because I don't get emotional about it. And so when they're getting, the crazier they get, the more level-headed I stay. And I'm just, a, and I, I'm able to just press back on them. I, I, it's hard to explain, but the fact that I don't use my opinion or don't have a passion about it, for some reason, it just makes it really easy. I I, I don't understand sometimes uh, why it makes the day. It makes the day easier because <laughs> yeah. I'm, not your day. I mean, you still have a lot of work and filing stories and seven minutes on you know politics. But um, but yeah, I mean, it does when when you're not getting angry at this or worked up over this well i i love it does that you keep your that, sanity yeah. i love that you say that you get so many different opinions that you almost don't even have an opinion anymore of your own you're just really checking i mean you just see yourself as checking the opinions of other people and just like fact checking and that that's what i think sometimes is is missing from journalism today as a former journalist i feel like journalists Maybe they don't know this, the topic in depth enough to check them. So they just think if I give 50% to this side and then give 50% to that side and let them check each other, then that's good enough. And, you know, I might think that that's, I would say it's not good enough. I mean, I don't think 50 and 50 is good journalism. I think good journalism is, is weeding out the truth from the facts, from the BS, from the, all that kind of stuff. And that's what probably you're trying to get to, right? And, and it has Just, become more difficult because politicians, broadly speaking, are more willing to misuse facts or just use incorrect information and sometimes on purpose. But we make an effort to then not put those t people on TV, where I think a lot of other organizations will continue to put them on TV. Now, if they're a governor, lieutenant governor, you don't have much option. You, you got to do yeah. that. But I, I do think social media has been a slippery slope for a lot of journalists, and it's created a bubble, Twitter in particular, with political journalism, where we think that's our audience, right? And people are slipping in, I think this, or this is crazy. And it allow, it, it's, it's been a slow grind allowing them to be more opinionated in their journalism. 
and that I think that has has created some problems across the board. I'm, you know, but but my again at the end of the day, I think I don't think we as an industry are taking into account enough our audiences and what they want and what they need to know. We're in our own bubble on Twitter, and we think that's our audience, and I think that's a mistake. I think well, we're definitely going to get deeper into social media, but but one question: the phrase "answering a question like a politician" is is well known. How do you ask questions that result in politicians? not answering like politicians. Because we all know when I'll do media training with clients, even I'll be like, listen, have you ever heard the politicians? You know, you just, you keep to the talking points and you don't answer the question. So how do you do that? Yeah, that, that's one of the most challenging things. And it's, that has also gradually gotten way worse over the years. Even, even local council members now are coached on answering things certain ways. Sometimes they're worse than a, a candidate for governor anymore. I Again, you know, this didn't happen overnight for me. I came here in 2002. I have spent 20 years now building a reputation in North Carolina and working with a lot of these politicians. You know, a lot of our, our governor and our attorney general, they were, you know, lawmakers and local council members, but I still covered them and talked to them. So when you build trust, I think there's an understanding in that relationship. People don't understand this, but it's a relationship between journalists and politicians. Not, not a cozy relationship, but it's a relationship, right? And so... If I know them on a good level and we built that trust, I think they're more willing to give us something that's not. That's actually why I, it's difficult interviewing presidential candidates because they don't care about me. They're just fulfilling what their press people say they need to do to get out to local audiences. So they're actually harder to interview. But, but honestly, I just try to be a human. <laughs> I ask questions in different <laughs> ways of, doesn't that make you mad? You know, that's a great question to ask a, a politician rather than just like, how do you feel about this rule? You know, like, if you be more human, you're going to get a more human response back. And a lot of that is just a comfort level for me being on camera and with these politicians and realizing that they're just ordinary people that are in extraordinary situations. And they have all the same insecurities that most of us do, even if they're egotistical. And so I try to keep myself on the same level as them. Sometimes it works out better. Sometimes it doesn't. And if they won't get off it, sometimes we just keep the interview short and we move on. Dude, uh, I think you, the best award you said you got is that people don't know where, where you stand. I think that's the biggest compliment you could get. No question. I should have, man, I should just have a trophy made. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was saying that you are the Steve Hartman of politics. When did that gel? Was there like, I, I could think back on different moments when I learned to write different ways during my reporting career. Was there a moment when the light went off and you said, you know, this is about, this is not about left versus right. This is, this is about telling a good story. Yeah, it really goes back to one story. So back in 2019, 2020, Spectrum News nationally said, look, we're going to refocus what we do in storytelling because it's so important. And we realize that when we do that, people stay with us longer, which is important to have engaged viewers. So we launched a, a mountain channel and they said, Tim, and keep in mind now, I'm largely doing studio stuff. I do my podcast and my nightly TV show. I'm not going out and doing stories. They said, go out for a week and get a whole week's worth of stories. I said, are there any parameters on this? And they said, no, to their credit. So I went out and, you know, I, I interviewed some politicians. Well, wait, was there the moment when you went, what, did, did that really just happen? Did... I was freaked out. There's no question <laughs> about it. <laughs> but, the, the, but the freedom was great, too, because I said, are there time limits? And they said, well, you know, within reason. And I, once, I, I once had a, a, a news director ask me, what, what can I do to make, you know, make your job easier? And I was like, did, did, they, did the aliens come in and change the, the bodies that out here when I've never been asked that I, I was stunned it was glorious Believe yes me. it was a great moment anyway so, sorry no you're fine so so I went out to the mountains and I interviewed this Christmas tree farmer Christmas trees North Carolina is one of the best states in the country for Christmas trees we've supplied I think 14 or 15 to be the official White House Christmas tree and this guy was one of them and he went out and met Donald Trump and he's got all kinds of great video and so we went out there and I thought the story was going to be about this guy and get to meet the president and do a Christmas tree. So we sit down and he insists we, we, we sit down at, and have dinner with him. And I, I put up cameras and said, let's just record this and see what happens. And he started telling these stories about like his son puking on the carpet in, in the White House. 
and his and his and his dad not knowing whether to put it back in the mouth or let it go and was horrified <laughs> and he wore overalls in the white house and his him and his girlfriend almost broke up over it and i'm like man those are the stories that you don't hear on tv and so i wrote the story with those stories within the bigger story of it now and the the reaction was wild people could not stop sharing it and they loved it and i'm like you know what this is a political story about the White House, but these are real life stories. And so that day I learned that, you know, the anecdotes, the memorable moments, you can do all the wonky stuff with that and you sort of blend it together like a song and people are gonna pay attention to politics. And we've been off and running ever since. So put, put, your, put your industry, you know, hat on as far as if you were looking at like broadcast journalism, from a 50,000 foot level, you've been in it for a minute, you know? So, so how, how have you thought that, how do you think it's changed since the beginning of your career and the coverage of, of politics? And, and would you say the changes are for the better or for the worse? You said it's hard for you to watch local news right now. Like how would you assess the industry from your perspective? Yeah, in short, to be determined, I think we're, we're really in a transition here and trying to sort it out. And that, that's all platforms. You know, I, I started, technically I started back in high school, I was a news assistant and we, in Fort Smith, Arkansas, we wrote scripts on typewriters. They had the carbon copy papers where there was seven different copies and you had to tape them together to put in the teleprompter, you know, and, and now I shoot most of my stories that are eight, nine minutes. We've won two Emmys with stories that were completely shot on a cell phone and nothing else, which is just remarkable. So the technology is allowing us to do a lot more. The, the, the days when I first started, there were three stations. There were no cable national news networks. So everybody watched you. That gradually changed. And now, you know, I have a nightly show where we're competing against, you know, national cable networks, local news that now airs at 7 p.m. in our market too. I have a podcast. There's what, 2.3 million podcasts out there, social media. So it's all this white noise. And I, I don't, I don't know if it's better or not. You know, I, I do think viewers have a bigger voice than ever, but in some ways that's become a problem too, mm -hmm. because they're trying, you know, they're, they're coming at us in some ways it's justified, but the audience is expecting you to own. I mean, I get emails from people that are just upset that I had somebody on from the other viewpoint. I mean, that's crazy to me, but that's yeah. happening out there. So <laughs> we have TikTok generation. My kids are all they do is watch TikTok. I mean, what do we do about that? Right. I do think that when people get older, and they get out of college and they start having to pay their own bills. They have kids. They're going to start caring about those issues again. So I do think that news and political journalism is going to be vital till the end of time. I think it's just a matter of figuring out how we reach the most audiences. And do we have to do that through 30 platforms and how we do that with, you know, less people than ever. Now, Spectrum has been growing, I mean, as an industry in general. Obviously, the media has its ups and downs and and, and we have our problems, right? The, the media has problems. So they're, they deserve a lot of the criticism that they get. But how do you think that, what's the answer to start restoring trust? Well, you know, so many industries have lost trust, government agencies, you know, but media is one of them. And obviously there's been a lot of incoming fire at, at the media for political reasons. But what do you think that journalists need to do to regain that trust? I think, um, First of all, I need to recognize that some of it might be true. I, I don't, I mean, I don't think it is about me, but it is about, I know it's not about me and about my company. I mean, in fact, we've doubled down. We have nightly political shows in almost all of our markets across the country. You know, we're doing, we're, we're growing with podcasts across the country every day. And so we're doubling down. But I think that the key is to be patient. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, some, some organizations need to look in the mirror, in, in journalists in particular. You know, I don't, I used to send tweets and not even think about it. I read them at least twice now before I tweet. And I'm especially nervous about breaking news on a platform like Twitter about. So uh, to the point where I don't care if I'm not first in some instances, I'd rather just get it right. And, and know, you know, that, so that's built trust. So it, it takes time. You know, some of it is out of our control because of things like social media platforms that are popular that they're just not you know, news is not popular on those platforms. And so do we need to find new ways? Probably. And corporations, again, not mine, but corporations, I think, need to be patient financially. They need to reinvest in these news organizations and they need to probably do more training about being, you know, fair and unbiased, which by the way, we do. 
In fact, I lead a lot of those trainings. And, and I, I think it's just gonna be bit by bit. We're a society that doesn't like to wait, but it, this didn't happen overnight either. So, and, and honestly, it's gonna take, the audience needs to look in the mirror and realize that they need to hear other viewpoints and, and not be so just assuming. Someone told me the other day that they didn't like my podcast because they just knew I was left. This was a state lawmaker. I've never met the person in my entire life um, and I never get that, but they just, they obviously only have want to hear one viewpoint. So we need to somehow, whether that's in our schools through digital literacy programs, teach our kids to, to listen to different viewpoints, maybe, I don't know. I mean, if I had the magic wand, believe me, I'd, I'd have a lot of money in my bank and I'd probably be on a boat right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just said so much stuff. I, I was listening to a podcast. It may have been one of yours. It was a topic that was very much in the news. And I had a hard time listening to the, an opposing viewpoint. And I was ashamed of myself. <laughs> but you did it. <laughs> yes. Yes. But it was like, it was hard because you did such a nice job telling both sides of the story. But no, I, it, and it was, it, it is difficult to hear stuff. I, I and this is coming from, you know, someone who did what you did. And, you know, it, it, I, I'm shocked at how programmed I've become. And, and I don't know and, whose fault that is either. I, I don't, I don't. I mean, we probably need social scientists and all that to figure this out with us, you know? Yeah. How much do I have to charge you for this session, Tim? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> so work out my issues. Uh, but the, the, you talked about social media, you know, a lot of the, a, a lot of stations, it's the first place reporters, digital first. They have signs up in, in their newsrooms. You, 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 how do you handle the pressure of having to have to have engagement or, or do you have that pressure of having to have to have engagement? And, you know, because it, the, the reporter's jobs now, you know, they have to, they have to tweet, they have to Facebook, they have to do this. They have to get, probably get on TikTok next. I don't know. It's a lot. Like, so how do you handle social media? And do you think that is helping or hurting? Like I mean, we have to worry about a brand, right? I mean, I tell this to marketing groups. I mean, we, we are a brand now and as individuals on social media. And it's scary to a lot of people and it's wrong to a lot of people, but it's true. But, you know, for me, my brand is trust. I built that and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that because that's what builds relationships with these folks. Social media has been the greatest and probably worst thing for journalists. It allows us to share our work and our brand, including our companies, obviously, better and faster than ever and to a wider reach, including globally. But it does create those problems of that pressure. We do not have that kind of pressure. You know, I, I don't I don't get I actually do check my own data because I think it's interesting to see what works and doesn't and to readjust some things. But we don't have that. I know I know there are some newspapers where they actually have leaderboards on screens in the newsroom. I think that creates an unhealthy competition and it creates more stories making it that may not be stories that they're more sensational than they are. So it's a dangerous thing out there. Mm. But, but you know, we're, we're still in a world where I think we're trying to figure out data. We have so much data and it's sometimes it is so clear. But again, I think as news organizations, we can't rely on just that because what we do is a mission. It's not just a product. And I, I think we somehow have to find that balance. A lot of journalists have gone off the deep edge because they realize when they do put some, something out there that's a little edgy or something, they get more retweets, right? And it, it's dangerous. It's been a hard balance. I'll tell you one thing. I used to have separate personal pages and I used to have professional pages. And it was such a mess to try to figure out which was which. And oh my gosh, if this one goes, and we've all seen it, right? Someone posts something on their professional page by accident, it was supposed to be on the personal page. So I finally had enough and I said, I am never going to post. I, I got rid of one page and had only one page for both pro, pro, professional and personal. And I made a determination that I will never ever say anything publicly that I, or personally that I wouldn't say publicly. And to be honest, again, it's just super easy now because I don't do that. Now I, I double check things before I post to make sure they're accurate, but you just have to, you have to put your guard up because People are out there waiting for you to make one mistake to determine exactly who you are, even mm -hmm. though it's not likely true. That's hard. And, and mm. that I, I I always tell people who criticize journalists and they're like, oh, they're, they've got an agenda. And I'm like, some do, yeah. But 90% of journalists 
their only agenda is getting to the truth. And they know they're only as good as their credibility, reputation. They're only as good as their last story. And if they mess up once, and we've seen journalists do that, it's hard to make a comeback. You know, your reputation and being being credible and is everything. And, and people don't get that. They think that a lot of journalists come in with a, an agenda and they're trying to make things happen. And I'm like, for 90% of journalists, if they're doing that, they're not really a journalist, right? Yeah. Well, and and look, there's a lot of criticism. I mean, I put up pictures of me and my family on vacation and stuff, and people will criticize, like, you know, why are these journalists putting up all this garbage that has nothing to do with journalism? But the truth is, is this is the same as the history of time since TV's been around. P look, people aren't going to like me or aren't going to watch me if they think they don't like me, right? And so it's a great conversation started too when the when the governor comes in and he says how was the rafting trip last week you know and so you, again you create that relationship between you and the politician and it gives a, a a story and they feel like they know you and so i i do think it's important i mean there's limits that you should put on that kind of stuff obviously but it, it can be really beneficial in a lot of ways it's just it's uh, just like anything in life there's a there's a, a bad path for it and unlike a lot of other things, it gets spread like wildfire and whether you delete it or not, it never really disappears. <laughs> so how, uh, just real quick, how's, how, how do you work a day? Because uh, you got a lot of things going on. You have, wait, you have the nightly report, right? Or yeah, so I do a nightly 30 minute show. I have a weekly podcast. And then I, I have a, this monthly magazine style show, which is at least 30 minutes. We actually just went in an RV last week across the state to tell stories for the upcoming elections coming hour next month. And then I- I oh, Charles Corral kind of thing? Exactly, that was what kind of inspired North Carolina guy, it was 55 years ago. So we said, leading into the midterm elections, what are people in our local communities care about? And ironically, hardly ever did Donald Trump or Joe Biden come up. It was issues like how many chickens you could have in your backyard corporations buying up neighborhoods to do airbnb and so that again that leads to mm. that I do so but and I, you, I, you, did you have to explain the second family to your wife or <laughs> no 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 no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but so i i segment my day i try to set because i used to try to do everything at once but it was way too difficult i felt like i was doing a lot of and getting nothing done and so i actually will set aside like just before i talked to you i was logging video for an hour and then I'm doing this. And then the next hour, I'll prepare for interviews for tonight's show. And then the next hour, I'll prepare for a podcast interview I have tomorrow. And then the next hour, I'll plan for future scheduling. So I, it's, it's very regimented, believe me. There's a lot of time at home I work too. And that's, that's part of what we do as journalists. We're not a nine to five job. You mean you're not going out for lunch? Uh... <laughs> no, I, 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 eat, I eat while I'm typing. Grease, greasy keyboard. Yeah, that's... <laughs> So speaking of your podcast, you have a podcast tying it together. You speak with powerful people in North Carolina to explain issues that the community that's important to the community. How, how did the, you know, the podcast start? How did, how's it changed in direction? And, and how, how also has everything that you've done before that really helped you with your podcast? Yeah, it was. Uh, so podcasts have been booming. I'm a huge podcast listener myself. I have hardly ever listened to regular radio anymore because I just I just love it. And I felt like it was important for us to become continue becoming a multimedia company. We can't you know, no company, I don't think can be just a TV station or just a, a, an audio company. I think they, you need to reach as many customers where they are and when they want it, which is a real challenge. But I think it's really important. And our company had already started a couple in New York. And so I put together like a 20 page PowerPoint presentation on how I would do it and why I thought it was important. And the reason I thought it was so important is because that was the time that people were just going after politicians, no matter what they said or did. And like you said about journalists, 90%, I would argue probably 90% of most politicians are in it for the right reason, really care about their communities, but that wasn't getting out there. And so I thought, what a great place to have like 30 minutes to have a conversation with who these lawmakers are and really what makes them tick. So why they make the decisions that they do, you know, in a different kind of platform, people can listen to it when they're jogging, you know, whatever, just like any other podcast. So it's just, it's been a really great tool in our toolbox of, of providing great content for our, our listeners. The, the TV stuff, you know, I, I do five, six, seven minute interviews with people every single night for my show. So that really helped. The hard part was understanding that podcasting 
it is different, right? Like they want you to be more laid back. They want you to ask more personal questions in addition to the rest. It's got to feel like a conversation, not an interview. So that took some time to learn to sort of, in TV, when you anchor, it takes forever to feel comfortable to where you're truly yourself and you're a really good news anchor, right? You just got to be comfortable. That's a huge part of the confidence of it. And the same was true for the podcast, to be able to let myself just be there and be myself, um, but also not make mistakes and say too much. The changing part of it has been that I've been adding, when I can, I have time, is adding storytelling to it too. And that has been a huge thing. Some of our best podcasts have been more of the storytelling ones, almost like This American Life a little bit with the North Carolina tilt to it. So I'm trying to do more of those, but that is way more labor intensive than bringing the governor in and sitting down for 30 minutes. What, what do you mean by storytelling? Well, you're just doing a podcast yourself telling a story. Is there an interview in there? So I will, I'll give you an example. One of my favorite ones I ever did was, so back in the 1800s, North Carolina used former slaves that they imprisoned wrongfully to hammer out mountains to build a railroad through and hundreds of them died and were just thrown in on holes on the side of the road so i went out and met a mayor that is his mission to get to the state to admit that it was wrong to put up a moniker and get their story told and so we went out to the sites with him and i interviewed him while we we're there and then they invited me back a year later when they brought out cadaver smelling dogs to see if they could smell remains from 150 years ago mm. and guess what they did and so i weave that all into a whole 30 minute storytelling podcast where it wasn't like straightforward interviews there was mm. you know, my voice track there was natural sound of the dog you know sniffing around and then talking to them while we're there so kind of in the field podcast taping wow that's so incredible cool. stories are so important and if you don't know like who most people can't spend the time, you know, news organizations, they don't spend the time telling those important stories. And those are the stories that we need to hear. It's crazy. Yeah. That, and all credit goes to my company, my bosses. I just, they give me that time and that freedom. Now we do, I still get all the other stuff done. There's times where I'm doing that story in 20 minutes before an interview, we're on the side of the road with a, a backpack up and I'm doing an interview for my nightly show that night. So, you know, if we can make it happen, they will give us the time and make it happen. But I'm telling you the feedback I get on that stuff. And you're right. No one else, no other news organization has told that story except for a newspaper did. But I mean, that's made for TV and made for podcasting. And so we're trying to provide something that no one else will give. And those historical stories are important in context of what's going on in today too, right? I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's awesome. Do you have it like, was, was there a feeling then or any of your stories you're like, yeah, this is this this is making a difference. This is I'm, we're telling something here. People need to know, and we're changing what what should have been in that case. You I mean, know, that's something why we that all, should have been fixed. Right, and that's uh, why we all years ago. journalists, right? I mean, do you feel like you you are having an impact? Yeah, and look, my ultimate goal is really simple, and this is for all of my platforms, and this has been the way since I started my my nightly show is that. I just want to make sure we keep the conversation going because people are not talking to each other. I, I said that in 2012 when we started the nightly show. It's more important than ever now. And so I hear people, I see the chatter on social media about stories that I post now, you know, with some of this stuff, and they are talking. I mean, I, I know a lot of investigative reporters, they like to see laws changed and things like that. And that that is great. I mean, just yesterday I found out I did a, a story on Frying Pan Tower, which is 30 miles off our coast. It's basically about to fall in the ocean. It's an old Coast Guard tower. And this, this guy from Charlotte's trying to save it. He bought it from the auction. And I went out and did a two nights out there. And I did a 30 minute special. Amazon caught wind of it and saw it. And they just donated $25,000 to the tower. Wow. wow. Um, so that's pretty cool, right? That's but, cool. More, but more importantly, on a way lower level, is that if I can just get people talking about these issues. One story we just did recently, a 23-year-old kid is on a mission to meet every single mayor across the state of North Carolina. I watched that story. That was a great kid, story. Right? Yeah. But, but you, I'll, I'll tell you why I call it zucchini bread in a minute. But it's like zucchini bread. Like he, you found out that cities are dealing with issues like water and sewer infrastructure, right? Like the super big problems for these communities that you would never know about if we didn't do stories like that. And so I call it zucchini bread when I talk about what we're doing with this storytelling and politics. Like with zucchini bread, when you're giving that to your kids, you're getting the vegetables and they don't even know it, right? Mm. So we're giving them politics, but 
but they're watching these stories and they're not even realizing their political stories. And so I, I'm trying to feed my audience zucchini bread every night. It sounds a little corny. <laughs> I, I used to put a spinach in my kids' eggs and I call them green eggs and ham and they had no idea that they were eating See? spinach. <laughs> it's for, it works. It works. <laughs> Got to do what you can do. You do. And then the nice thing about the donation from Amazon, it was there between 10 and 12 on delivered on time. So Even perfect. 30 miles out to sea. <laughs> So really what we need, I mean, I think the problem is we don't have enough spectrums out there. That's the problem. I like agree. We, need, we need to multiply spectrum times like a lot. <laughs> I, okay. I but that said, that said, okay. So you're, you're in, I mean, North Carolina couldn't be a more perfect place to talk about politics. And, and I mean, and you have an amazing gig where you've help with the help of the company, you've created an amazing opportunity, amazing opportunities there. But is there, a, is there a job that you would be, you know, could they steal you away? Or, or? If, Believe me, I've been here 20 years. If I was going to get stolen, and it's, 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 it's been tried a few times, not recently, but a long time ago. Uh, I, in fact, I, I, a long time ago, I interviewed with CNN. They wanted me to potentially be one of their DC guys. But no, I actually, I'm more firm believer than ever in local news and the impact that I can have on it. And I hope that I am having on it. My family is a huge part of that. I'm 45, my kids are 13 and 10, and I want them to have their dad around, not traveling every single you know, week to a different location. So I, I, you know, I'm, I believe I'm in a perfect sweet spot. And I think we need people like me and not just 23 year olds telling local news because Part of what makes me a better storyteller now, you asked that question earlier, I didn't fully answer it, is that I didn't realize to just step back and realize what's important as a viewer myself is important. And so I tell stories better because of that. And so we need people that have perspective and experience to do that. And this place allows me to do that. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy as can be. I can't imagine. I mean, what a would I take on helping? And I do, I helping our larger spectrum, you know, someday doing more of this type of storytelling. Yeah, of course, but I'm a big believer in what we do here. There's nothing that CNN or CBS National News can offer me that I, I don't have here. The guy yeah, knows how to wrap up a, a podcast. I mean, that was like, all he needed to do was just add the, the Tim Boyum Spectrum News <laughs> <laughs> sig out and, and we were good we got a promo <laughs> no but I, I think that a lot of journalists would be jealous of the freedom to just do good work you know I mean that's the problem if you look at you know there's so many ridiculous restrictions like you know you know in tv journalism you know this you know you you have to have a minute 15 because you know the the all the data says that you know no package can be over a minute 15 and otherwise we'll lose viewers and so we used to call them one fact a pack. I mean, what? How many facts can you get out in one? You know, so you can't do the good work. But man, you're you're able to do because of where you work and the niche that you've created. You're a lot. You're able to do like the great work that actually has the potential to make an impact. That's yeah. That's I'm really amazing. blessed. Although I will say, nothing was handed to me. I've spent 20 years, you know, building this, and then I present them with a plan where it's hard for them to say no. <laughs> uh, and I don't ask for things to be taken away. <laughs> so all this stuff has been added on over time, but we find ways to make it happen. And look, I mean, if we weren't getting results, a lot of this probably wouldn't happen. But even the ability yeah. to experiment, yes, is a massive blessing. And I'm not going to keep doing something that's not successful either. So if any, any of these projects I'm not doing, we'll look at the next great thing. I mean, I think for us to be nimble and willing to change as a media organization, as one of, any media organization is one of the most important things ever. The hard part is, is it takes talent and on patience and in often cases money and a lot of companies are you know with pressure shareholders and that it's it's just it's hard to do and also broadcast stations they're just stuck in that old format of the mm -hmm. way to do things and i think i think they're afraid to change because they're afraid of you know they're just afraid yeah, we'll, we'll look at local news and we're like, why are you leading with a story that everybody could get online? Why don't you tell the stories in your own backyard that nobody gets to tell? That's what I would do as a local news station. But they're still leading with something that you could have watched on CNN or gotten a, you know, a, a thousand notifications on your computer. And I'm like, that's like the, that doesn't work anymore. Yeah, you already know about it. So why are you watching? That's the really hard part for newspapers. I'm a big believer in what we're doing on TV. Newspapers should do 
for next day and just handle the breaking news online. You know, I, I think they should almost become more like magazine papers with because they're much more equipped to do really great in-depth investigative pieces. So why not drop a two-page spread on on something like that with more depth to it? But there's a lot other people that could pay a lot more money than me to do that. So I guess they have all the answers. <laughs> well, you, have, you and that 17 you. producers that you have, how, how, how many, yeah, right. <laughs> do you have a producer? Do you have yeah, I have, I have right now I have one producer, but he produces my, sh my nightly show and another show, but my podcast is literally me. I do everything. Wow. And my yeah. nightly and my monthly show is me. And I have, I call him producer. Most people call him a photographer, but he's an artist. The two of us work on those together. So we, a lot of it's wow. just, yeah. Well, you guys got to keep up the great work. It's, yeah. it's been a pleasure and a it's joy. Inspiring. It, it, it is really inspiring. Really, we, we love having you. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Oh, man, I'm, I'm honored so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Kathy, that was fascinating. I mean, the, the, the ground that he has covered, the way he's able to do longer, thought-provoking, smart pieces. I mean, it, it, that is just a jewel and, and great reporting. And he's great to listen to. And he really loves what he's doing. I, I just was really inspired by talking to Tim Boyum. Yeah, maybe CNN or I don't know, Fox News, they're listening. Do news this way. Come on. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this week's episode. After Deadline, the media podcast is a production of On The Mark Media. If you enjoyed what you heard today and want to hear more of our interviews with incredible journalists across the country, be sure to follow us on social media at On The Mark Media and subscribe to After Deadline, the media podcast, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Until next time, we'll catch up with you after Deadline.